Well, good morning. good morning. It is so good to see you all here. Somebody turned down the temperature outside, but at least it's warm here in the house of God. It is good to see you all today. We have, um, I'd like to do something a little different this morning to start out. And uh, I hope you guys don't mind, uh, don't mind giving me just a little bit of leash here. We, we've got a special birthday in our congregation coming up this week. Mr. Bill Elliott is turning 102 on Saturday. There we go, he raised his hands. And if you don't mind giving me a little bit of uh, privilege, Martha Jane and I, I think we're going to lead you in a little bit of singing. Can we sing Happy Birthday to, to Bill Elliott? Let the choir uh, start us off on worship here. Well, as we begin in worship today, I just want to draw a few things uh, to your attention. Uh, first of which is uh, at the end of each pew, you're going to notice uh, these little attendance pads here. I want to invite you to fill that out. It's our way of connecting with you. If you are a guest today, uh, joining us maybe uh, for the first or second or third time or however many times, uh, just let us know uh, that you're here. We'd love to connect with you and, uh, and touch base with you. I also want to let you know that if you have something that you would like prayer for, in the back of each pew, and Pastor Jackie's lifting it up there, is a little um, rectangular card. You can fill that out, and when the offering plates come around a little bit later, uh, you can slip your prayer request in there, and you can mark it and designate it either as a personal prayer request for our pastoral staff or as one to be shared with the congregation. But those are two ways in which we can connect and care for each of you. As you are able, would you stand with me now as we join in our opening hymn, This is the Day.
please join me in the call to worship. Praise the Lord, the true and righteous God. Hallelujah to the maker of heaven and earth. For he is our hope and help. He brings justice to the oppressed and exalts the lowly. He feeds the hungry and frees the prisoner. He loves the righteous and turns the wicked upside down. And his compassion is for those who are needy. The Lord will rule forever. His kingdom will never end. Pray with me. Blessed are you, Lord, our God. Glorious is your name in all the earth. We celebrate who you are and all that you have done for us. You hold our lives in your hands. You catch us when we stumble. So we come together today, led by your Holy Spirit, to worship you, to sing your praise, to confess our mistakes, and to receive your love and mercy, made possible through the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ. Come among us, Holy Spirit, as we open ourselves to your word and lift our hearts, minds, and souls to worship in your holy presence. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs>
Ed and the Lord blessed us with wonderful musicians. They've been awesome. Thank you so much, Marilyn. Thank you so much, choir, for leading us into worship this morning. You know, it's great to be a part of this congregation. And uh, if you would, in your bulletins, you'll see a little green sheet like this. Uh, this is our GPS, our Grow, Pray, and Study Guide. And it has uh, several opportunities for you to get involved and get engaged in the life of the church. And I would just lift up a few things this, uh, this morning. First of all, to thank all of you who came out to support us for our uh, first Wednesday night meal. I think we had over 50 in attendance on Wednesday, and it was a wonderful, wonderful time of fellowship and, uh, and devotional time. And so thank you all for being a part of that. Um, this week we're going to have a taco bar, and we hope to have just as many, if not more, coming out. Also want to let you know that today is our annual charge conference, and you all are invited to be a part of that. That will be at 5 p.m., in Pekin at Grace United Methodist Church, and the address is there for you in the bulletin. Uh, also want to invite, uh, if any of you have any musical gifts that you'd like to share with us, we're looking at adding um, a, a new musical group to our 11 o'clock contemporary worship service. If you play uh, an instrument, guitar, keyboard, uh, drums, bass guitar, uh, anything like that, or you are a vocalist, um, Feel free to email me, let me know. We'd love to get you plugged in there and, and active and, and serving. And then finally, uh, we have our trunk or treat, which is coming up in just a few weeks on Wednesday the 25th at 6 p.m. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the, in the narthex for you there. Uh, and if you'd like to come out and, and hand out candy to kids in our community and share some of the love of Jesus, uh, we want to invite you to do that. Well, anytime we come before the Lord, we have an opportunity to give of ourselves. We can give to God through our, our worship, through our singing, our praises, through our prayers, but we can also give to the Lord through our financial gifts. And I would say this, uh, if you are new or you're visiting with us today, we hope you feel no sense of compulsion to give to the life of this church but for those of you who call Tremont UMC home, this is a way in which we further the ministry that God is doing through us to our community and, and touching lives all around the world. And so as you give today, recognize that in God's hands, our gifts can do far more than they can do in our hands. And so the ministry of giving is an opportunity for us to partner with the Lord. One of the things that you did recently to partner with um, our agency at Midwest Mission Distribution Center, Peg Ramsey, uh, came about a month ago and shared uh, some of the things that the Midwest Mission Distribution Center in Chatham, Illinois, is doing. And Chantel Corey, the executive director there, sent us a thank you note uh, saying, thank you for helping to meet the needs of, uh, of our children. This is a joy that comes when we show God's love in practical ways and give generously. So thank you, Tremont, for the way in which you're supporting the mission and ministry of the Midwest Mission Distribution Center. You are making an impact, and you are changing lives. As the ushers move among us, let us give thanks to God through our giving.
you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we dedicate into your care these, our gifts. We thank you, Lord, for providing everything that we need. We now return to you just a portion of all that you have given to us. Lord, we pray, touch these gifts, bless them, multiply them, and use them to do amazing and wonderful things for your kingdom here on earth. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you're standing, would you join with me in affirming our ancient faith? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. may be seated. Our next hymn is, It is Well with My Soul.
As we enter our time of prayer, I would ask you to take out your GPS again. And there in the center are, um, is our prayer list and several people that um, have requested that we pray for them. I would ask you to hold them in your hand today as we pray and then lift maybe just one name up off the list this week or um, put it in a place that reminds you that to lift them up in prayer this week. And today, let us pray for the people of Israel and the brokenness in our world. We will start this morning with a moment of silence to center ourselves in prayer. Just breathe. Allow yourself to breathe in the Holy Spirit. Exhale and let go of the many things on your mind. Share those burdens, fears, your frustrations with God. Breathe in the Holy Spirit and let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Though the world around us tosses and tumbles, though we have doubts and fears, though our hearts are hurt and our spirits ache and we lose our way, though we encounter wickedness and hate around every corner, your stories and your songs, they comfort us. Your will and your way, Lord, they nudge us along. Your presence and your promises, they give us all the hope that we need. We hold fast to you and sing praises to your name. Lord, hear our prayers today, spoken and unspoken. Our friends and family, and each of these on our prayer list. You alone, Lord, know exactly what each one needs. We ask that you would bring comfort to those battling physical and emotional illness. Be near to those with upcoming surgery and bring calm as procedures are waited and in the books, but not quite done. Those struggling with treatments, Lord, and those dealing with everyday life challenges, give them your healing strength. Grant wisdom to those who need answers to difficult questions. And bring your calm to those facing life decisions and adjusting to change. And surround those, Lord, who are grieving the loss of loved ones. And today, Lord, we especially ask you to be near Robbie McDonald as he is really struggling with the loss of his mom. Lord, help them to feel the comfort of your loving embrace as you walk right beside them through their time of grief, that they would feel you touching them in every moment. Our God, the encourager, the compassionate, the merciful, our holy, blessed God, disturb us, rouse us from our sleep, lift us into consciousness of your presence. Change us, move us, mold us for the better, so that at the sound of your voice, at the call of our name, you will make us to never be the same. May our worship do this, and so much more, everything to glorify you above all else. As we pray your prayer together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from Psalm 146, verses 1 through 10. I'm reading from the New International Version. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed are those whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord, their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea, and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts, lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow. But he frustrates the way of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. These are the words of God. If you believe they are true, please say amen. 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 came across an interesting article this week. It's a few years old. But in 2021, a group called Harmony Healthcare released the results of a fascinating study on my generation, the millennials. And a lot of people are studying my generation these days, and generally good things don't come out of studying my generation. Um, we tend to be the most irresponsible generation and um, the least refined. And uh, this study is no different because they studied my uh, generation's relationship with the healthcare industry. And the study drew a number of interesting conclusions, but the one that really piqued my interest most was found under the heading that said, Millennials turn to Google for medical advice. That's not good. According to the study, more than half of all millennials, 69% in fact, trust Google more than their doctor when it comes to giving medical advice. Let that sink in for a second. Now for those of us who do visit the doctor, it says 83% use the internet to conduct their own research after receiving advice from their doctor. And a whopping 24%, almost one quarter of all millennials, say they trust Google enough to generate an accurate diagnosis when they enter in their symptoms. Now what this points to is that my generation overwhelmingly puts more stock in the wisdom of an automated search engine than they do in the wisdom of a trained practitioner of medicine. And this has led to a few troubling trends. Among them, millennials are not getting annual health checkups because, of course, you have to see a doctor to get one of those. Second, millennials are ignoring ongoing health issues and allowing them to go unresolved, which means we either go unmedicated or, maybe even worse, we self-medicate. But the most glaring issue of all is this. Millennials are putting their trust in something that isn't really equipped to help them with their problems. Because remember, Google is a search engine, not a healthcare provider. Now we could look at all of those conclusions and we could say, hey, you know what, those are some serious issues. But I think that you'll all agree with me that the underlying issue here, it isn't really about medicine, it isn't about technology, it's about trust. And the implicit message my generation is sending is that we trust what is fast, cheap, and convenient rather than what is actually helpful. And my point is this. 
All of us trust in something. And there's a lot at stake in who or what we trust in, isn't there? Because we know that trusting the wrong thing can lead to disaster. And of course, this isn't just a modern concern. It isn't just a 21st century concern. Even Scripture provides guidance on this topic, the topic of trustworthiness. And the Bible urges us to use caution when deciding where we place our trust. And the Bible usually gets at that by painting a picture in a particular way. Usually it looks like this. Near, in nearly every experience humans have, we have a choice to make. We can trust in God, or we can trust in an alternative. And as long as there is an alternative for us to consider, the Bible says there is a danger that we end up misplacing our trust. And the Bible addresses this very, very frequently. I think of Psalm 20, where it says, Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. And the implicit message there is there is a choice that we can make between trusting in God or trusting in power. But there's a choice to make. Or Proverbs 3, Trust in the Lord and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. And here are the choices between trusting in God's wisdom or trusting in our personal wisdom. And in everything, we have a choice about where we place our trust. And the point of connection for us today is that we really can't worship God until we trust in Him. And establishing trust with God requires us to really do four different things. The first is prime our hearts for praise. The second is to detach ourselves from temporary fixes. The third is to accept the hope and the help God provides. And then the fourth one is to experience his compassion for ourselves. So we're going to look at each of those things today, but first we have to determine if God is actually trustworthy. And that's our starting point for today. How can we know that God is worthy of our trust? So if you have your Bibles with you or your smartphones, I want to invite you to turn to Psalm 146. And we're going to begin diving into that question. But before we do, would you all pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for your spirit, which you have given to us and equipped us with so that we are able to exercise good judgment. And today, Lord, as we close out this series, we ask that you give us clarity and faith to put our trust wholly in you. Not in ourselves, not in our resources, but in you and in, in who you are. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you were here last week, we studied Psalm 100, and we did something of an autopsy on worship. We discovered that worship really consists of two components. There's praise and there's thanksgiving. And so worship very often begins with us expressing praise to God. It's something we do any time that we come into this, this room, this sanctuary. And so Psalm 100, unsurprisingly, opens with a call to praise. Psalm 146 opens with a similar call, but here, this one is different, because the invitation is self-addressed. It's self-addressed. Because here the psalmist isn't speaking to the nations. He isn't speaking to people far away. He's speaking to himself. He's speaking to the depths of his being. He's preparing his heart for the work of praise. And this is what he says. He says, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I will praise the Lord as all of my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. And you hear all the personal pronouns there, don't you? This isn't about you. This isn't about the guy down the street. This is about him. Bless the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. How many of you have ever been to a professional baseball game? Most of you. How many of you are Cardinal fans? How many of you know the walk-up music for your favorite Cardinal players? Oh, okay, there we go. One of you. 
Verses 1 and 2. You guys know what I mean when I'm talking about walk-up music, right? When, when, when the batter is on deck, he's waiting for his turn to get up to the at-bat. When, when it's his turn, there's music that comes on. And that music is meant to be this bridge, this 10-second bridge that takes that batter from the on-deck circle all the way up to the plate. And I love verses 1 and 2 because verses 1 and 2 are like the walk-up music, the anthem for our life of praise. You know, every player on a baseball team has, has a song, a walk-up song that helps them get dialed in for their at-bat. I think verses 1 and 2 are like the walk-up music for everyone who is called to praise. Think about Tommy Edmond. Tommy Edmond, every time he steps up to the plate at Bush Stadium, Good God Almighty by David Crowder gets played. And 55,000 people hear it blaring through the stadium's sound system. Why? Because that's Tommy Edmond's jam. That is his anthem. It's the thing that gets him fired up and ready to face anything the pitcher can throw at him. doesn't matter if it's a 100-mile-per-hour fastball, a filthy slider, or even Clayton Kershaw's 12-6 curve. doesn't matter. Tommy Edmond is getting dialed in. His walk-up song is getting him in the zone so he doesn't chase pitches out of the zone. When a batter hears their walk-up music, it gets them primed. It gets them ready to go to work. I think verses 1 and 2 are so instructive because they remind us, you know what, we shouldn't come into worship cold. Before we praise God, it's worth taking the time to get ourselves primed and ready so that everything within us is positioned to honor Him. Think about how long baseball players warm up ahead of a game. They do batting practice. They, they throw. They stretch. They run. They jog. They do everything to get themselves ready. And I just wonder, when we come into worship, have we warmed up? Have we gotten our hearts primed and in position to praise our God? And I don't know, that might look different for you than it does from other people. Maybe for you that looks like quiet time in the morning before you come to worship. And maybe that looks like spending some time reading Scripture, delving into God's Word. Heck, maybe it means listening to some Christian radio while you're getting ready and in the shower. But the payoff, I think, is when we have hearts that are primed and ready to praise God we end up connecting with God more deeply. And with deeper connection comes deeper trust. If you want to grow in your confidence in the Lord, it starts with priming your heart for praise. Getting your heart ready. Well, then you move on to verses 3 through 4. You find prepping our hearts to worship God, it's an important prerequisite because it conditions us to turn to God first and foremost. It becomes a reflex in our souls. The problem is that, you know, when we talk about turning to God, that isn't really our default setting as people. When you're facing a crisis, unless you have done some prep work ahead of time, we have a tendency to look for help not in God, but in other people or other places. And let me say this, there's nothing wrong with looking for support among friends and, and family when you're going through a tough time, but, but the psalmist urges us to be careful that we don't depend on others to hold a place in our lives that only God was meant to fill. The psalmist says, do not put your trust in princes and human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground, and on that day their plans come to nothing. Why should we be careful about trusting in people? Two words, folks. Expiration date. There, there isn't some deep, hidden meaning for me to unearth here, folks. Fact is, you and I will not last forever. As mortal beings, we don't have staying power, not like God has. Some of you have spam in your pantry from 1974, don't you? And you know that if you cracked open that Spam this afternoon and you ate that Spam, you'd be just fine. Spam lasts forever, don't it? God's like the Spam in your pantry. You and me, we're like the 2% milk in the fridge. We maybe have two good weeks in us. Here's what I know about milk. It's good when it's good. And it's really bad when it's bad, isn't it? What do you do with milk on the day that it reaches its expiration date? 
This is a bone of contention in my household. What does expiration date mean? Does that mean it goes bad on that date, or does it mean that's the last date that you can actually consume that thing before it makes you sick? What do you do on the milk's expiration date? Do you trust that milk? Do you trust it enough to drink it? Are you going to let your kids or your grandkids dip their Oreos in that milk? Are you going to let them eat their Fruit Loops with that milk? Guys, there are expiration dates on the promises of people. And it's not because you're bad people. It's because there are expiration dates on people. We are perishable beings. You might be a great friend. You might be a great spouse, a great coworker, a pen pal. Do people still do that? I don't know. But the problem with you and me is that we won't last forever. Therefore, we can't be trusted forever. Eventually, we turn to dust. And you can't trust the dust. God is different. God will last forever. God won't give out on you. Scripture says that no word from the Lord ever fails because the Lord our God is eternal. And that means His word stands forever. Don't miss this, folks. People are great, but people are temporary. Love your friends. Love your family. But folks, put your trust in God. The psalmist goes on. He says, there are people who trust people, but there is another group of people. They put their trust in the Lord their God. And for those who put their trust in God, they experience blessing. Check this out. Verses 5 and 6. Blessed are those whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. So there are two things we discover about God when we place our trust in Him. When we place our trust in God, we discover that God is our helper and God is our hope giver. Y'all say helper. Y'all say hope giver. We're going to go to school for a second. Y'all want to learn some Hebrew? Let's learn some Hebrew. The psalmist says that God wants to help us. Let's talk about that word help for a minute. The Hebrew word he uses there for help is the word azer. You want to say azer? Congratulations, you just passed Biblical Hebrew 101. Good job. That's an interesting word that he uses there because the word azer is the same word used to describe Eve when she was created by God in the story of creation. Some of you may remember Eve was described as a helpmate, an azer for Adam. Same exact word. But you may also remember the irony of Eve's creation. You may remember that, that Adam originally couldn't find a suitable azer among the rest of creation. He searched high, he searched low. He looked among the birds of of the air, the beasts of the field, the sea creatures of the deep. He couldn't find a suitable helper. And it was Adam's inability to find help on his own that prompted God to provide what Adam lacked. And this is the kicker. When Adam went in search of his own help, He couldn't find it. But when he turned to God for help, he got just what he needed. What's interesting is how this lesson is negatively applied just a few chapters later to Adam's son, Cain, in Genesis chapter 4. We get to Genesis chapter 4, And we discover that Cain has been cast out of Eden for killing his brother, Abel. But in this act of amazing grace, God places a mark of protection on Cain to prevent him from being killed in revenge. But unlike Adam, Cain rejects God's help. He rejects God's azer, and Cain instead builds a city with walls to protect himself. And so rather than trusting in God's help and God's provision, Cain decides he's going to trust in himself instead and in the walls he built around his life. And the tragic consequence of this is that Cain missed out on what could have been a life of blessing. Because remember, the difference between Adam and Cain wasn't that one messed up and the other didn't. 
The difference between Adam and Cain isn't that one lived righteously and the other one was wicked. The difference is that Adam trusted God's help and Cain chose to trust himself. Cain built literal walls around his life to insulate himself so that no harm could befall him. And I'm willing to bet that many of us in this room have created similar barriers in response to something that we did that we're ashamed of or something that was done to us by someone else. It's a natural human response, isn't it? We get hurt and the walls go up immediately. And I think we do that because in our mind, walls help us keep the bad stuff out. And you know that's probably true. But the testimony of Cain seems to be that walls also keep the good stuff out. Can I say this? Trusting in God doesn't mean you're saying bad stuff will never happen to you. Trusting God means allowing Him to be your helper rather than putting hope in yourself. God wants to be your helper. God wants to help you, to be your azer. And folks, can I tell you that he is well equipped to do that when we put our hope in him. Speaking of hope, God is also our hope bringer. One of our deepest human needs is hope, but hope is just a vehicle. Behind every hope, we need a driver. Everybody say driver. Hope needs a driver. We need something or someone that will guide our hope toward its destination. Doesn't matter if you think your life is, is a Maserati. Doesn't matter if you think you've got a Hemi under the hood of your life. Something has got to drive that vehicle so that you arrive at your destination. Everybody needs a hope. And everybody needs a driver for that hope. I don't know if you guys are NBA fans. I'm not. I don't know a thing about the NBA. But I do remember... Uh, being in the gym in Pontiac when LeBron James announced that he was returning to the Cleveland Cavaliers after spending four years in Miami with the Heat. And it made a lot of people, I remember, in Cleveland very, very hopeful. It was this big homecoming. The king, right, was, was coming home. And, and the hope that was, was being built in Cleveland was driven by this belief that LeBron James was capable of leading his team to an NBA championship. And in 2016, that's exactly what happened. He led them to a championship. But guess what? LeBron James doesn't live in Cleveland anymore. Two years later, he left Cleveland for the Lakers, and the Cavaliers, the very next season, ended up with the second worst record in the NBA. By 2020, LeBron was lifting the trophy with the Lakers, and the Cavs were watching it at home on TV. We all need something or someone to drive our hope. And the psalmist doesn't tell us to live without hope. He just says for us to be careful about who we put in the driver's seat. If we're expecting an athlete, a friend, a job, or a spouse to drive our hope, we may be disappointed. I talk to a lot of parents that get really upset when professional athletes do something that, that seems um, out of character, it seems selfish. And they say, well, my, my son has made that, that athlete a role model. And I tell them, well, don't let your son or your daughter make an athlete a role model because an athlete's job isn't to raise your kid. It's to be an athlete and make a lot of money. You be the role model. More importantly, let Jesus be the role model. So I'll tell you what, athletes get traded. Loyalties change. Companies hit rough patches. So do marriages, by the way. And just because someone is driving you today doesn't mean they'll be driving you tomorrow. And that's why the psalmist says, trust in God instead. Because God is different. He's different because He's faithful. He's faithful in a way that is eternal. In fact, the word there is the word emet. And, and it is God's emetness, His faithfulness, that keeps God in the driver's seat. When your life gets tough, 
God stays behind the wheel. That is his emet coming into play. When you run out of gas, God stays behind the wheel. When you feel lost, God stays behind the wheel. And it's all a product of his faithfulness as our eternal God. When you strip trust down to its essential components, it boils down to help and hope. Why do we trust? We trust because we all need help from somewhere. And we all need hope from someone. Let me ask you this. Where do you look for help? When you're hurting, when you're feeling vulnerable, do you turn help into a personal DIY project? Do you go out to the she shed and start building a wall around your life? Or do you call on the name of the Lord your God and worship Him? Where do you look to for help? And who do you turn to for hope? Do you look for a quick, temporary fix? Do you entrust your life to, to somebody who's here today but gone tomorrow? Or do you entrust your life to a God who is lasting and faithful, who doesn't abandon us when things get tough? The Lord is our help and our hope. And I tell you, he wants to be those things for you. One last thing, and then I'll, I'll leave it here. There will always be a link between our worship of God and our level of trust in God. I'll say this. It is easy to trust in God when our circumstances are favorable. Trust is natural when your cup is full. But you know, it is harder to trust God when you're experiencing hardship. And yet it's in the hardship that our trust is best able to grow and mature. And maybe that's where you're at today. Maybe you're sitting in that pew and you're living with some unaddressed needs in your life today. Maybe life doesn't look so rosy. Maybe the road looks a little rough for you. And I want you to know that if that's you, I want you to listen to the last few verses of Psalm 146. Psalmist says that the Lord upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the way of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. Doesn't that sound like victory? Doesn't that sound like someone who's been through it and has come out on the other side? I want you guys to know Psalm 146 wasn't written with the idea that worship would come easy or that trust would be taken as granted. Sometimes you have to go through the hard stuff to get to the good stuff. But I want you to know that if you're sitting there today and you're in the middle of the hard stuff, this isn't the end of the story. But you do have an opportunity today to choose where you're going to place your hope. To choose who you're going to name as your help. And so my encouragement today is hold on. Don't hold on to things that are going to be here today and gone tomorrow. Don't hold on to things that are perishable and temporary. But hold on to the God who is eternal, who is full of immense faithfulness, who has staying power, who will be here today, who will be here tomorrow. He will be here next week and forever down the line. Because I tell you what, the King is coming. And although these momentary troubles may last for a while, our hope, and our help is in the God of Jacob. And his promises last for an eternity. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the way in which you have ministered among us today through your Holy Spirit. And today my prayer is for every heart, every heart that is hurting, they would encounter your faithfulness. Lord, that we would learn more and more each day to put our help and put our hope in you. 
to name you as the one who will lead us by the hand through this life. And Lord, that doesn't mean that every day is going to be easy. In fact, today may be incredibly hard for some of us. But we're trusting in you. We are leaning into you. And so, Lord, today we turn our hearts over to you, trusting that you will take care of us, that you will deliver us, that you will lead us, that you will guide us, and you will provide for us no matter what challenges we're facing today. And so, Lord, we name you our helper and our hope giver. And we thank you, Lord, that we can trust in you because you are faithful for all time and in all places. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sometimes you have to name the victory before you see the victory. Would you stand with me and sing victory in Jesus as we close out our service today?
Here's what I don't know. I don't know what challenges you are facing today. I don't know what news you received this week. I don't know what hardship you're going through. But here's what I do know. The God who calls us is faithful. He is a met. And because of his faithfulness, we can trust in him. I pray that you put all of your trust in the Lord today, each and every day, knowing that he'll walk with you through the hard times and through the good times, through the valleys and up the mountains. He'll be with you each and every day. Go forth in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and let that live in your soul. Amen.